Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Pierre Siklos on sovereign debtors in distress. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. It's my pleasure every week to welcome a noted expert in some aspect of global governance into the studios here at the Center for International Gov Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'm happy to welcome back uh, Pierre Siklos, Professor of Economics mm -hmm. at Wilfrid Laurier University and Director of the Wiesman European Research Center. And Pierre, we're happy to have you here in part because we get to do a bit of a retrospective on a major conference that CG held last week on sovereign debtors in distress. And uh, it was a, a closed meeting, but one, of course, with great public implications. So uh, we'd like to talk a bit about that with you, uh, your perspective on the conference as a participant and what you thought the upshot was. But just to tee that up for us, perhaps you could uh, give us a little bit of the background to the, the general question of sovereign debtors in distress? Well, it's pretty simple. We had a major financial crisis that arguably started in the U.S. and it led several governments you know, to try to avoid the crisis by ramping up government spending. And since very few had surpluses, they had to borrow extensively from private markets. And in some cases, the borrowing predated the crisis, but in other cases, it didn't. And so now we have large segments of the world economy, the Eurozone, the U.S., Japan historically has been there for many years, who have uh, very large debt-to-GDP ratios, and the outlook doesn't look good for a return to surpluses in their fiscal positions, and so now we have uh, stress, uh, renewed stress on financial systems, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to cope with. And just to contextualize a bit, who actually holds the debt? Who's, who's on the hook for what, and who's lent money to whom in the grand scheme of things? Well, in recent years, the, traditionally it's been the public. Uh, generally, that means households, firms, and it could be domestically. In Japan, much of the debt was or is held domestically. Uh, in the case of Canada and the U.S., for example, much of the debt is held abroad. We always hear about how China is buying U.S. treasuries. But recently, the big switch has been for central banks in the respective economies to hold government debt. And that's been controversial because historically that means that central banks literally print money uh, in return for holding this debt, and that's creating concern. Some of it has to do with inflation. Some of it has to do with default because the debt becomes too large. The other concern is what it means to central bank independence. Does it threaten the central bank independence, which was achieved in the early to mid-1990s and is viewed as being... Uh, a marker of good institutional quality. Uh, it's a good way of defining the relationship between the central bank and government. Mm -hmm. And that's under threat now. Right. And yet we don't actually live in an era of inflation, which is interesting. So is that something that we can expect to come down the road the more these central banks hold debt? Well, in theory, the answer is yes. But in practice, there are a couple of reasons why the answer might be no. One is that because central bank independence is entrenched, if and when the economies begin to improve, there's a feeling that these central banks have learned their lessons and they will ramp up interest rates and tighten uh, monetary policy and remove these, uh, this debt from their balance sheets. So they have the wherewithal to do that. They have the independence to do that. The question is whether politically it will be feasible and at what speed. They're not going to do it overnight. They'll do it gradually because central bankers are cautious. So. If you believe that story, then inflation should not be much of a problem. Nevertheless, there are economists, prominent economists, who argue that some inflation might be a good thing because it's an easier way of getting rid of all this uh, massive buildup of debt. The question is how much inflation is acceptable. Right now, inflation rates are 1% to 2% in much of the industrial world. Some are arguing that uh, inflation of 5 or 6% would be okay. The problem is that you can't control inflation the way you control uh, water coming out of a tap. And once you let the genie out of the bottle, we found that previously in the 1970s and early 80s, that once inflation takes off and expectations of inflation take off, it's hard to control. Mm -hmm. Now, when an individual or a household experiences debt distress, uh, a couple of things can happen. They can adjust by reducing spending, uh, trying to boost earnings, and at the extreme, um, bankruptcy is an option. 
and if nothing else works, they can be subject to foreclosure or, right. or repossession of goods and so forth and so on. What about a state? A state is in debt distress. What are its options? Well, essentially, it's to do much of the same things, but rather than call it bankruptcy, you just default on your debt. Or, in addition, what you can do, because you're a sovereign, you're a state as opposed to a household, is you can negotiate with uh, people who loaned you those funds. And usually, in the bond market, it's sort of, uh, there's a group of bondholders that you negotiate with, or an association that represents these bondholders. In theory, householders can do the same thing, but uh, they're not in the same position as uh, a country is vis-a-vis -vis its, uh, its lenders. So it's, in theory, it's easier for a sovereign to negotiate its debt, and that's what we've seen with uh, Greece, and uh, historically it's happened with other uh, debtor countries. They re renegotiate their debt typically by um, asking the bondholders to take what's called a haircut, basically reduce the actual, effectively, the amount of money that's uh, owed to them. And that's attractive to the lenders because the alternative is not getting any of the money back. That's right. Now, one complication <coughs> in recent years is the so-called credit default swaps. And so bondholders will buy insurance in case of a default. So the issue then is what do you consider a default? Is a restructuring of the debt as is happening in Greece, is that a default? Well, we're about to find out soon because the association that makes those decisions is going to make a judgment about whether this is a default or not. The only problem is that the same association that helps negotiate the re debt restructuring is also the one that's going to make a decision about whether it's a default or not. And markets are very worried because once there's a default, these, uh, then these insurance, these credit default swaps come into play, and there's a worry that that might create further instability in the financial mm -hmm. system. Right. Well, very good. We'll be back again in a moment with Pierre Siklos to talk about sovereign debtors in distress. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk a bit about what the, the people helping sovereign debtors in distress do. So in the case of Greece, we've read a lot about uh, European bailout, largely, largely financed by Germany, or at least engineered by Germany. Um, what exactly, exactly is happening there? It's not a bailout in the sense of here's, here's a lot of free cash. It's an infusion of, um, of money, I guess, in the form of credit, essentially, under mm -hmm. what sorts of terms? Well, essentially, they have this debt that's due, and to put it a little bit simply, and they need to roll over the debt to keep operating as a, as a government. And so Germany and the other Eurozone members are helping them along to try to reduce the debt load. But the quid pro quo is what they call structural reforms. So we've heard about the difficulty that the Greek state has in uh, collecting tax revenues. We've heard about the corruption. We've heard about the, the size of the public sector. We've heard about the lack of competitiveness in many of their uh, industries. And so the quid pro quo is to lay down conditions, fairly strict ones, for Greece to ensure that they improve all those uh, factors. So they improve on tax collection, and uh, the rest, and so that's the, that's the idea. They'll help them out as long as they help themselves. The problem is that you, know, you can roll over the debt, but you still are left with it, and even in spite of the debt restructuring, most estimates suggest that uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio is still unsustainable. In fact, uh, just after the uh, release of the, the so-called, well, some people call it a bailout, but the restructuring of the debt uh, not too long ago, uh, a, uh, a confidential IMF report was leaked, which essentially contradicted the IMF's own view, or at least stated view, and the view of the Eurozone members, uh, in particular Germany, that the uh, restructuring would, would solve the problem, so to speak, put Greece on a safer uh, fiscal footing. It appears that that's not the case. And then the other issue is, well, what's, number, what's the, the right number for the debt-to-GDP ratio? such that the economy can sustain itself. And the Eurozone basically has decided 120 percent. No one is quite clear why it's 120 percent. It's not derived from any sort of model or formal calculation, but it's thought to be the appropriate number. And it doesn't look like Greece will get there very quickly. So that's another problem. Mm -hmm. So what's the constellation <coughs> of actors in the, in the global governance world to help 
solve these kinds of short-term acute sovereign debt problems? Well, one of the problems is that we don't have uh, any, we have some principles, but we don't have any formal arrangements. And that's why there's been an argument that's been ongoing for some years about having a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Basically, what you know, in the U.S. they would call a Chapter 11 type framework, or a framework for, for resolving bankruptcies, or in this case, defaults on sovereign debt. And that's what's missing. The question is whether that's, it's feasible to do that on a global scale. But essentially, the institution that's always uh, approached in these situations is the IMF, because that's the only one that seems to be able or willing to or capable of handling these issues, along with, in this case, the Eurozone members, and indirectly, uh, the U.S., for example, and China and some other large emerging markets like Brazil are uh, indirectly involved. Mm -hmm. Now, the IMF operates as a sort of a pool, <coughs> and countries in distress can go and draw upon that pool for right. short-term relief. Right. Different in the Eurozone, I assume. So the European bailout package is cobbled together how? It's the, the member countries contribute in the same way, on the same basic principle as the IMF, or is it a, a separate kind of... Uh, a, um, stress reduction mechanism? It's separate. In theory, in the, in the IMF's case, there are rules in place about how much you are able to borrow against what you put into the IMF. And already, for example, Greece has exceeded that amount because there have been some side agreements that have allowed to Greece to access some funds that would otherwise not be available. But at least there's a framework there. In the case of the Eurozone, there's nothing formal, at least not until officially 2013 when a, an institution will start that will handle these types of issues. And so countries in distress, in theory, could go to that institution and borrow subject to certain conditions. But right now, it's, uh, it's a bit ad hoc. And so because the ECB is not allowed to bail out countries directly, it can't buy the, uh, officially, the, it can't, uh, it's not a lender of last resort, it can't help out these countries. And so it's done so indirectly by pumping liquidity into banks all over the Eurozone uh, to help reduce the liquidity problem. So until 2013 and this new institution comes into play, there's nothing formal. It's basically ad hoc, which is why we've had almost every time the Eurozone uh, heads of government and uh, finance ministers have met, that's why they've always had to cobble together a new agreement or a revised agreement, precisely be for these reasons. Right, but when the ECB pumps money, and pumps liquidity into these economies, it's not just printing money, right? No, it's not, that's right. So where does this money come from? It's a roundabout way of asking if, if you're Germany and you're a big part of the bailout package for Greece, are you taking on sovereign debt to help Germany with its sovereign debt? How are you financing it yourself? Well, to go back a bit, <clears throat> it actually, it's not printing money in the sense that it shows up on the street. Uh, but it is creating money out of thin air by telling these banks that they can access the ECB and it's done on the basis of electronic transfers and the idea is simply to try to make these banks profitable enough that they can uh, start to to lend to commercial concerns. It's when it still spills over to the household sector and the commercial sector that banks start to, the central bank would start to worry about having to actually literally print money. We haven't reached that stage yet. Essentially what the ECB is doing is lending at 1% and allowing these banks basically to take that, those funds and reinvest them very often into sovereign debt. And so if, even if they buy Italian and Spanish debt, they make a healthy profit on that transaction and it provides them with liquidity. But it doesn't really directly help the Eurozone economy. It just prevents the financial system from seizing up completely. Mm -hmm. And the institution or mechanism that comes online in 2013, what's that going to be called and how will it operate? Well, right now we have something called the Euro European Financial Stability Facility, which is essentially an uh, institution that's created by individual Eurozone members, primarily Germany, lending money to this new institution. And this institution is supposed to hold high quality assets and lend against those assets and use those to help countries in distress. In this case, for example, Germany and to some extent uh, uh, Portugal, for example. In 2013, they want to uh, create a new facility called the European Stability Mechanism, which basically is supposed to be more or less modeled on what they have now but it's a more formal arrangement where countries can go and borrow against funds that were contributed to this uh, mechanism. 
And the debate is how large should that fund be? And in fact, in a recent uh, G20 meeting, the, the, uh, the non-European G20 members basically said it's not large enough and you need to make it larger to prevent some of these uh, European economies in future, if they're in distress, from going to the IMF or China or Brazil to borrow it for additional mm -hmm. funds they need. Mm. Well, very good. We'll be back once more in a moment with Pierre Siklos. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk a bit about the conference. So a uh, high profile group of uh, experts, um, world leaders, uh, former world leaders in any case, uh, coming together to talk about this and imagine how the world might uh, better deal with these sovereign debtors in distress situations. What sorts of ideas were on the table? What particular topics tended to come up more often than others? What sort of institutions and mechanisms kept coming up in the conversation? I think first and foremost, after the former Prime Minister, Paul Martin, made his uh, keynote speech uh, in the evening, the first evening before the conference began, was this issue of having a mechanism to resolve sovereign debt. Much like firms and in individual economies can go bankrupt and they go through a, a well-known procedure, something on a global scale is needed. And it was pointed out that on at least a couple of occasions, once uh, 10 years ago and the other time a couple of years ago, uh, such proposals were turned down and the idea was the IMF would be the go-to institution to deal with these issues. And I think in the conference what was clear is that while members from various parts of the world agreed that there were some common principles on about how you handled the, the sovereign uh, debt issue, the difficulty was getting agreement on something that would apply globally. And so when people say, well, a sovereign debt resolution mechanism the obvious question is, for whom? You would not treat, politic, for political reasons, the U.S. as you would Greece. And so that's where the problems begin. So everyone uh, agrees that that's a desirable goal, having a one mechanism in place. But finding agreement on what that mechanism would look like looks to be awfully difficult. So it wasn't simply a collective action problem, people not wanting to pay for the public good of this mechanism. It was specifically worrying about different countries and their situations and whether this mechanism might be able to uh, that's precise, those yeah, That's precisely right. In particular, when Greece, which came up a lot, the, the question comes up, well, how did they get into trouble? And you treat a country that gets into trouble because they didn't have the, the right institutions to finance their spending, there was corruption, <clears throat> there was other forms of government inefficiency. Do you treat that country the same way as another country who gets into a debt problem because of bad luck? Uh, so you can imagine Japan having to uh, rebuild after the tsunami, uh, they would be treated differently. And so that's where the problems begin, is how do you treat different sources of shocks that lead to these sovereign debt issues. And is it possible to imagine a mechanism that would be context sensitive that way? Or is there only one way of dealing with the sovereign debt crisis? You, you lend money with a, a fixed set of terms according to some template and then hope for the best. I think there is, in principle, a way of making it idiosyncratic to some extent. The difficulty is who makes those decisions. You don't have all these countries that, uh, whether they're part of the G20 or the IMF more generally, that are treated equally. And that's reflected in the IMF itself with the, the voting pattern. The U.S. has more votes than, say, a smaller country. And so if you have unequal treatment in the voting mechanism in the, the IMF, you're going to have some inequality in the treatment when you get into these sovereign debt problems. So, again, a practical problem there. And was there enthusiasm at the conference for revisiting the idea of trying to come up with an IMF-based global mechanism, or were people more inclined to look for regional solutions or to turn to the G20 and invest it with the kinds of decision-making power to come up with on-the-fly responses to situations? My sense is that there was enthusiasm for trying again to go back to the drawing board and try to devise one of these sovereign debt resolution mechanisms. The problem was who would handle this? Uh, because many of the representatives, as you sort of hinted at earlier, came at one point from the IMF, and because of the IMF, of its, because of its history, is a, is a natural place to go to. Uh, 
but it's also felt that the IMF has lost a lot of credibility over the last few years. And so something stronger is needed to infuse sort of credibility and uh, believability in such a mechanism. And so the G20 was mentioned as one obvious source. Surprisingly, less mentioned, less frequently mentioned was the Financial Stability Board, which is supposed to be that the arm that was, was created from the G20 and supposed to deal with financial stability issues. It was not mentioned as frequently. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, when it comes to institutions, the, the European case is a little bit different because if you're a Eurozone member, technically there's no way to kick you out. And so the issue sometimes was, well, what are the consequences of Greece leaving versus Greece staying and being helped out? So those were uh, regionally specific uh, problems that were also dealt with. So. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned uh, a credibility issue the IMF had a few years ago. What was the nature of that credibility issue? Well, when you speak to representatives from Asia, uh, they will always point to the advice that they were given uh, as the Asian crisis was unfolding. And in some cases, the, that uh, advice, 1998. that's 1997-1998, Asian financial crisis. And it was often viewed as being bad advice. They were asked to, be, uh, to introduce austerity programs when that was perhaps not advisable. There were social consequences, very severe economic consequences. And as a result, one of the reactions throughout Asia has been to build up their foreign exchange reserves to a massive extent, uh, China being the obvious mm -hmm. example, precisely to buy insurance against a future uh, necessity to, for the IMF to come in and give them renewed advice. So there's a lot of skepticism. And 1997, 1998 is not that long ago, and they remember this. And so uh, the advice from them is, uh, Yes, there's some value in going to the IMF, but uh, you have to take care because their advice has not always been the best one to follow. So if countries are amassing reserves as a kind of hedge or insurance policy, does that mean that there's been a decline in supply of global liquidity? And if so, wouldn't that make the IMF more relevant because it is officially the lender of last resort for distressed economies and they've, they've got a mechanism, the SDR? Well, the buildup of reserves actually reflects what uh, Bernanke, the chair of the Federal, U.S. Federal Reserve, once called the global savings glut, which is that one of the ways to finance their uh, growing economies has been to uh, promote savings. And so Asian economies typically save a lot. And so they, there is a, a lot of global liquidity, but it's invested in places like the U.S. Treasury and, and uh, high-quality assets. So the problem is not the lack of liquidity. The problem is the lack of trust in some respects vis-a-vis uh, -vis the IMF uh, as sort of the, um, the, the referee or sort of the, mm -hmm. the middle person in, in this process. But that's not money that can move where it's needed. In principle, it could. Uh, there's no reason why, say, China couldn't use some of its massive foreign exchange reserves to effectively lend to mm -hmm. the Eurozone. But Question politically, willingness. yes, uh, politically, it's, it's not viewed as being a sort of a desirable thing to do. Right. Very good. We'll be back once more with PRC Close. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's come back to Europe and to Greece, which of course is the trigger for all of this mm -hmm. uh, rumination and hand-wringing about the future of the global right. economy. Um, what do you foresee happening? We've had, I suppose, what some people would call the good news recently of the approval of a European bailout package. Um, Greek government managed to pass its own uh, internal reform restructuring program, notwithstanding the unrest on the streets and mm -hmm. sometimes violent demonstrations on the streets. Have they basically cleared the hurdle? Is the path now open or are we still in for some fairly nasty surprises? I'm not sure if we're in for nasty surprises, but the big question still remains uh, over all this uh, issue is whether Greece will effectively default. I just saw recently an estimate. Uh, we spoke earlier about these credit default swaps, and it turns out that it costs something like over $7 million uh, to, uh, per year to insure roughly $10 million of Greek debt. And so if you translate that into what's the likelihood of default, it's something like over 90%. Mm. So markets believe in the coming year, the probability of Greece defaulting is extraordinarily high. Until you get over that, you don't solve the Greek problem. 
Beyond that, of course, there are the spillover effects. How will countries that are also in distress, particularly Portugal, to a great extent Ireland, to a lesser extent Spain and Italy, which are too big to fail, how will they be treated if uh, it's necessary for them to, uh, to get some kind of uh, additional assistance? The hope is that this new mechanism will be in place next year and we'll be able to deal with that issue. But it's a brand new institution. It doesn't have a track record, so we don't know how it's going to work. So there's still some bad mm -hmm. news to go around. So it sounds as though the markets have actually priced in a Greek default, which in principle would mean the global economic repercussions wouldn't be that significant. Is that correct? Well, I don't know if the, the, the global repercussions would be small. They might be very large simply because, as we saw in the last financial crisis, it's the, the unknown that uh, the, the source or the type of problem that comes up that uh, rattles markets. And so Greece is known. There's a likelihood of default there. Um, there's been less attention on Portugal and Ireland. If they begin to make noises about defaulting, then it could be an entirely different story. Mm -hmm. And if it goes really badly in Greece, what happens operationally? Does it mean that Greece is forced off the euro? Has to go back to the drachma, devalue? Is that the worst case outcome? And if so, what happens to Greece and what happens to the euro? Well, most people think the worst case out outcome is for Greece to leave the eurozone, even though there aren't any formal mechanisms as such for Greece to leave the euro. It can. But then the consequence would be the introduction of a new currency, which technically is not a huge issue. But the consequences would mean, presumably, a very rapid and sudden devaluation, a tremendous drop in living standards. And since uh, Greece is a part of Europe, uh, I don't think Euro the rest of Europe, even if Greece left the Eurozone, can ignore it entirely. The social consequences will be great. And then people will ask, well, if Greece leaves, then maybe Portugal or Ireland will leave and then the Eurozone would become fragmented. And those who remain in the Eurozone, who have done well like Germany, also have to worry because each time a weak member leaves, presumably that makes the remaining members stronger economically. And so the currency, the, what's left of the Euro, will be uh, worth more. And so that will start to hurt the Germans. The difficulty is that if Greece remains in the Eurozone and the other members who are in distress remain the pressure is going to be on them because they use a single currency to deflate their economies. But the ECB, which is, conducts monetary policy for the entire Eurozone, has to worry about inflation over the entire Eurozone. So it's conceivable you have this strange situation where a lot of countries have to deflate. That reduces inflation in parts of the Eurozone. But the rest of the Eurozone has to inflate. And so Greece and other members like Finland, who have performed very well, they'll have to put up with higher inflation. So they get penalized, they get punished for acting well, basically, in the Eurozone. <laughs> so it's, it's not an easy problem, and uh, it's hard to be too optimistic in the current situation. I remember some of the people who were skeptical of the idea of the Eurozone in the first place when it first came up <coughs> pointed to a number of things that they thought any currency union would obviously require. One was a strong mm -hmm. central bank, another was some sort of transfer mechanism to equilibrate between areas of stress and areas of prosperity within the zone. Mm -hmm. And another was some sort of orderly withdrawal exit option. Precisely. It sounds as though we're actually finding our way to all three of those. We're figuring, figuring them out after the fact, when perhaps we should have thought about them at the beginning. Yeah, that's right. I mean, those are issues that will have to be dealt with. And in fact, they came up at the conference. The notion that there is no proper exit strategy, that might help the European situation. The second one is that there's no fiscal union. There was some debate in the conference whether it should be a full fiscal union or some hybrid. It's likely that some hybrid would be useful so that there is at least some common element to fiscal policy. There's a way for the members to watch over each other, to conduct the type of surveillance that obviously was missing in the last uh, decade or so. So you're right, all these issues will come up and the question is whether the politicians, the current crop, whether they'll still be there to fix the problem or it'll be a whole new crop of politicians that will have to deal with mm. these issues. Well, thanks again for coming in and helping us understand these complicated issues much better. I feel as though I understand them better. Thank and you. thank you to our audience for joining us again. And please, please join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.
banks hold debt? Well, in theory, the answer is yes. But in practice, there are a couple of reasons why the answer might be no. One is that because central bank independence is entrenched, if and when the economies begin to improve, there is a feeling that these central banks have learned their lessons and they will ramp up interest rates and tighten uh, monetary policy and remove these, uh, this debt from their balance sheets. So they have the wherewithal to do that. They have the independence to do that. The question is whether politically it will be feasible and at what speed. They're not going to do it overnight. They'll do it gradually because central bankers are cautious. So if you believe that story, then inflation should not be much of a problem. Nevertheless, there are economists, prominent economists, who argue that some inflation might be a good thing because it's an easier way of getting rid of all this uh, massive buildup of debt. The question is how much inflation is acceptable. Right now inflation rates are 1 to 2 percent in much of the industrial world. Some are arguing that uh, inflation of 5 or 6 percent would be okay. The problem is that you can't control inflation the way you control uh, water coming out of a tap. Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Pierre Siklos on sovereign debtors in distress. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. It's my pleasure every week to welcome a noted expert in some aspect of global governance into the studios here at the Center for International Gov Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'm happy to welcome back uh, Pierre Siklos, Professor of Economics mm -hmm. at Wilfrid Laurier University and Director of the Wiesman European Research Center. And Pierre, we're happy to have you here in part because we get to do a bit of a retrospective on a major conference that CG held last week on sovereign debtors in distress. And uh, it was a, a closed meeting, but one of course with great public implications. So uh, we'd like to talk a bit about that with you, uh, your perspective on the conference as a participant and what you thought the upshot was. But just to tee that up for us, perhaps you could uh, give us a little bit of the background to the, the general question of sovereign debtors in distress. Well, it's pretty simple. We had a major financial crisis that arguably started in the U.S. and it led several governments you know, to try to avoid the crisis by ramping up government spending. And since very few had surpluses, they had to borrow extensively from private markets. And in some cases, the borrowing predated the crisis, but in other cases, it didn't. And so now we have large segments of the world economy, the Eurozone, the US, Japan historically has been there for many years, who have uh, very large debt to GDP ratios. And the outlook doesn't look good for a return to surpluses in their fiscal positions. And so now we have a uh, stress, uh, renewed stress on financial systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to cope with. And just to contextualize a bit, who actually holds the debt? Who's, who's on the hook for what? And who's lent money to whom in the grand scheme of things? Well, in recent years, the, traditionally it's been the public. Uh, generally, that means households, firms. And it could be domestically. In Japan, much of the debt was or is held domestically. In the case of Canada and the U.S., for example, much of the debt is held abroad. We always hear about how China is buying U.S. treasuries. But recently, the big switch has been for central banks in the respective economies to hold government debt. And that's been controversial because historically that means that central banks literally print money uh, in return for holding this debt. And that's creating concern. Some of it has to do with inflation. Some of it has to do with default because the debt becomes too large. The other concern is what it means to central bank independence. Does it threaten the central bank independence, which was achieved in the early to mid-1990s and is viewed as being um, a marker of good institutional quality? Uh, it's a good way of defining the relationship between the central bank and government. Mm -hmm. And that's under threat now. Right. And yet we don't actually live in an era of inflation, which is interesting. So is that something that we can expect to come down the road the more these central And once you let the genie out of the bottle, we found that previously in the 1970s and early 80s that 
once inflation takes off and expectations of inflation take off, it's hard to control. Mm -hmm. Now, when an individual or a household experiences debt distress, uh, a couple of things can happen. They can adjust by reducing spending, uh, trying to boost earnings, and at the extreme, um, bankruptcy is an option. And if nothing else works, they can be subject to foreclosure or, right. or repossession of goods and so forth and so on. What about a state? A state is in debt distress. What are its options? Well, essentially, it's to do much of the same things. But rather than call it bankruptcy, you just default on your debt. Or, in addition, what you can do, because you're a sovereign, you're a state as opposed to a household, is you can negotiate with uh, people who loaned you those funds. And usually in the bond market, it's sort of, uh, there's a group of bondholders that you negotiate with or an association that represents these bondholders. In theory, householders can do the same thing, but uh, they're not in the same position as uh, a country is vis-a-vis. -vis